So um, my question uh, uh, in, in regard to the study is about education. Uh, right. How important is it that um, the clients, or in this case the, the pregnant women, uh, understand um, the test that's going on? Or do, if yeah. they do understand it, does that make the test uh, less uh, empirically valid? Uh, mm -hmm. Or um, does, is it really important just that they understand the benefits of the mosquito treat, uh, mm -hmm. the, the insecticide treated nets? Tell, tell us a little bit about that side of things. Okay, um, so I'll start with understanding the benefits of the health product. And if I go off on a tangent, remind me to come back to this. Okay. Um, <laughs> So this was an area where people, like I said, people were very familiar with malaria and people had used forms of bed nets for ages in the past. So lace things would hang um, over sleeping spaces. Those were sold in markets. But the, the long lasting insecticide treated net that has been developed by um, Vestigard Franson and you know certain manufacturers uh, is really sort of ideal I see. Um, for knocking out the mosquito and protecting people. Um, what was nice about this context was that they were getting it through a prenatal visit, so the nurses were able to talk to them about the importance of sleeping under a net. I so see. I wouldn't say that we can generalize this to what would happen if we drop mosquito nets from the sky. Right. But you sort of raise an interesting question that um, is really at the nexus of public health and economics, which is where I sit. And... There's really a pro an approach in public health. There's like a two-pronged approach in the public health and medical world to global health, and that is three-pronged maybe. Create a really effective product, um, oral rehydration therapy to combat diarrhea, um, water purification, um, mosquito nets. Make it as cheap as possible and then educate people about why it's important. So tell them, you know, um, it's good for you to sleep under a net, it protects your baby, et cetera, et cetera. Right. What economists have found quite a bit is that the education piece is much less effective than you might think. Although maybe if you think about it, um, coming from the U.S. perspective, um, you know, we know that we should be going to the gym. <laughs> we know that we should be, um, you know, limiting sugar. Right. We know, you know, there are lots of things that we know we should do that we don't do. Right. And psychologists and marketing people know that just telling people that something's good for them is not usually the most effective way to persuade them to do it. And so indeed, in many of these experiments, people have found that the education that you give people around wearing shoes to prevent worms or purifying your water, those kind of things, for the most part, is less effective than other things that have been tried, like subsidizing the product, um, uh, doing certain types of marketing, persuasive marketing, um, packaging it in a certain way. Um, on the other hand, there have been some really cool experiments that have found very effective types of information. I'll give you a really quick example, from the, also from this region of Kenya, um, which we all call the Sugar Daddy experiment, which um, was all conducted by um, the woman who I did the bed net experiment with, Pascaline. She, so what she found was that women, um, girls in secondary school in Kenya were often having relationships with older men in exchange for, you know, little amounts of money, not in a prostitution way, but, you know, their boyfriends were older because there were like nice things about dating someone older. Right. But the prevalence of HIV among these much older men was much higher than the prevalence among boys their same age. Right. And this was contributing to a much higher prevalence of HIV among young girls than young boys. So what she did was an information campaign that what was about relative risk. So it wasn't an information campaign that said you should abstain, you should use condoms. It was about the, the men you are sleeping with have much more HIV than the boys your age. And this was a tremendously effective really? um, experiment. Um, she found reductions in um, childbearing among ch uh, girls that age, risky sexual behavior. Um, and they substituted toward relationships with boys their age. And so there have been examples of carefully thought through information um, that has been given um, 
that has been very effective. In the context of malaria, um, just to come back to that for a second, I think that... um, you know, information tends to be a barrier the way it is for lots of other diseases. People aren't really sure what the right medication is. They're not really sure where they can be diagnosed for the disease. Um, not always sure what the best way is to prevent it. And um, so information is an issue, but this sort of ham-handed approach of just telling people what's good for them doesn't tend to be that effective. Interesting. So, so th- it sounds as if... The, the 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 big shift that has occurred in thinking about uh, development economics and thinking about foreign aid and and um, uh, combating the suffering of extreme poverty is that we've moved to these empirically based randomized uh, trials uh, and uh, and and uh, how, how how could you talk a little bit about your, I yeah, mean, that's right. in the Poverty Action Lab and your, your experience with that. That, that. When you started your dissertation, that was pretty new stuff, right? I mean, this is a relatively recent phenomenon of tr- trying to apply these social science techniques to right. large groups of people with very deep problems. Right. How, how yeah, that- so that's um, – I, I, that gets back to the other question that you asked earlier, which is why was there this perception that we should charge something and where where do trends in global aid yes. come from? Right? Yeah, that yeah. was the trend was that we have to charge something. And I think it comes largely from anecdotes, but it also comes from, and this is the motivation for these type of experiences, it comes a lot from practitioners' experiences. Yeah. So an example I give a lot in my class is from arthroscopic knee surgery. So there were tons of these surgeries done um, in the U.S. Um, for knee pain, and lots and lots of money spent. And the doctors that were doing them were, and the patients were 100% sure that these surgeries were working to cure pain, right? Until someone came and did a placebo uh you know, randomized controlled trial where some people got the surgery, some people just got an incision and, you know, a fake surgery. They didn't actually do it. And some people didn't. And what they found was that the placebo placebo group had just as much pain resolution and functionality as the group that got the actual surgery. Right. And this is, I mean, why we do placebo blind randomized controlled trials, because we know that, um, that we can't trust our anecdotal experience. Um, And I think that this is the case with um, lots of people working in health and poverty. They see themselves doing doing good. Right. And they know that it is effective. But what you don't understand is what would be happening in the absence of your intervention or what are you actually, and what would happen elsewhere if you did it. And so this is an attempt to sort of bring that rigor and um, systematic approach to social services delivery and health delivery that we have in medicine. Um, Some people in, you know, the aid world and the Mm -hmm. policy world have embraced this um, and some haven't. I think there are um, there's a lot to discuss about the sort of pros and cons of this approach. Um, The pros, as you can probably see already, are many, um, which is that. Um, it's not the best idea to spend a lot of time and money on programs that we don't know are actually doing yeah. anything or are potentially even, you know, um, <clears throat> we could be spending our money in better ways. We could be doing it a little better. Um, we could be doing it um you know, in a smarter way, a more cost effective way. Um the other nice thing about randomized controlled trials is they're very transparent. So in the simplest case, yeah. you have a treatment group and a control group, and you can say, how much did diarrheal disease decline right. when we gave people pure water, and how much did it you know, decline in the control group? Right. And it's transparent. So policymakers and people can understand that. The other thing that's nice about it is it's replicable. So just because the bed net thing was true in Kenya doesn't mean it's true in Zambia or Senegal or wherever else. And when you have a sort of our typical approach to social science, just doing these sort of secondary data analysis um, explorations, we can't replicate it in other places. This at least 
Not that we would replicate this experiment 8,000 times, but if we wanted to, we could. So that's it. For me, that's an interesting issue because what you've learned is that the uh, free uh, bed nets work very well in this one particular area in Kenya. Right. But does that, if you're working in, in uh, another part of the world, have you right. learned anything? I mean, do you have to run the experiment again? Is it, yeah. is it, is your knowledge scalable, I guess, when you're doing this kind of work? Exactly. So you just got to the heart of the kind of debate about this approach, which is the, what economists often call the distinction between internal validity and external validity. So a randomized controlled trial has excellent internal validity. It tells you exactly what the effect of a program is without um, confounders, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that it will work somewhere else, right? right. So we so we could have a situation where, uh, you know, um, you know, in a different country, women's husbands were against them sleeping right. under a net, or it was too hot to sleep under the net in another place, and so it didn't necessarily. The color of the walls in right. the clinic could have mattered. I mean, you know, psychology experiments show that tiny, subtle differences in the environment could have made a big difference. So there are two approaches to this question of um, what do we actually learn from these experiments beyond something in a very local, specific context. One approach is to replicate the heck out of it. So right. this is actually the medical approach. Yeah, right? yeah, right. When something becomes established, it's because someone does a meta-analysis in the Cochrane, you know, systematic reviews of a hundred trials of an asp a type of, you know, aspirin or something. Right. Like that. And to some extent, that is becoming prioritized. See, the issue with that is that academics, right, who are doing a lot of this work, don't have a whole lot of incentive to do these things over and over and over yeah, again, right. right? Because they're sort of in the publishing business and um, are in the knowledge generation business, and you don't learn so much more from replication. So there have been some institutions that have um, come into place um, there's one called 3IE, the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, and others that set aside funding specifically for replication. I see. Um, but the BedNet study, for example, has been replicated in several places because it was, you know, thought to be very important for this, you know, very crucial um, right. health tool. And others have been replicated. But the other approach, um, and this is getting back to, you know, sort of the, the old business of economists, is to feed into a behavioral model about a model of human behavior and think about, all right, well, is there something more general we can learn about how people respond to prices in developing countries for health tools like this? And it turns out that we can, and in fact, for a lot of preventive health tools, and again, this is You'll recognize this from the U.S. Right. A lot of preventive tools, people are very price sensitive, right? So yeah. even small increases in price and people just sort of, but for treatments. So I have another experiment in Kenya that looks at malaria medicine, and there's much less price sensitivity, right? Because you need a medication right away. You know, there isn't a lot of discretion there, but with a bed net, you can put off the decision. So it's not really about do I want a bed net or don't I at 75 cents? It's maybe I can buy it tomorrow. That's right. You don't, or maybe you, I can yeah. buy it today. And so, but the big criticism, so there's an academic criticism of economists who do this, which is why are you in the business of tinkering with public health things? Like we're, we should be learning about behavior and I see. systems and, you know, you're not, you're not helping us learn about that. And then there's a... Um, uh, sort of policy and programmatic criticism, which is that if I'm the malaria control, national malaria, head of the national malaria control program in Senegal, you haven't told me anything about what I should charge for bed nets in my country. So, um, you know, there's uh, this debate um, going on, and I think that people who do experiments have tried to move closer to integrating it into some kind of theories that we can generalize and also to replicating. Um, and there's also been a, you know, a really interesting um, a, uh, attempt to try to understand how close can we get to the, to the experimental results 
from non-experimental methods. I see. Um, so, huh. you know, how, how well do we do? Um, and, um, but there definitely has been a prioritization of these types of approaches in global health. And yes, the Benden experiment was pretty, there were several key experiments that happened in the few years before this in developing countries. Um, there was one on um, deworming medication and the fertilizer thing had been going on. And about when, is, about when were those experiments more or less? About 2000, around 2000. so a few years. Okay. Yeah, so there were a couple of them starting. And then, but experiments like this in the US for welfare programs, um, especially job training programs is where the sort of literature and the um, began, started about 20 years before that. So, and go back just for a moment to the fertilizer experiment. So how did, did they find out what, what it would take to get people to use fertilizer? Yeah, so it's an it's a it's an interesting result. So, um, so first, what they had to do is step back when things weren't working, and they were, and step back and say, all right, let's make sure that if these guys plant fertilizer, their their crops actually are better. <laughs> because with a lot of these products, we assume that things will be better, and they're not necessarily. Right. Farmers are very risk averse for obvious reasons uh, because their subsistence and their livelihoods depend on. Um, but, you know, they found that um, even a little bit of fertilizer increased the profits of these guys by um, quite a bit. So th I think it was 30, maybe 20 or 30 percent. So it increased it by like $15 off of a $90 profit a year. So a lot for a poor yeah. person. And um, but people weren't using it. And so the first thing that they found was that the time lapse between harvest and planting was kill was killing them. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. when you harvest, you have all you know. You're sort of cash rich, or you're right. less poor. You're less poor a little bit, and um, farmers weren't able to save the money from the additional crops that they got to pay for the, the fertilizer, fertilizer in uh -huh. the next planting uh -huh. season. And you know there are sort of behavioral reasons for this, um, which are things like. Um, you know, um, the ability to plan for the future and um, to prioritize and willpower right. and things like that. But there are also a ton of competing demands on people's expenses, like school fees, and not to mention that there's quite a bit of community insurance in these areas. So if my neighbor's plot was not so successful and he sees that mine was, there's a lot of pressure to help him out. So what they did was, that was tremendously successful, was they offered them the opportunity to buy the fertilizer in a pre-commitment way, so at the time of the harvest. Um, and so farmers could pay for the fertilizer for the next season right after they harvested initially. And this allowed Four them to savings, get around yeah. these problems of self-control and also these community pressures. And that um, was tremendously successful. In fact, they found as successful at increasing fertilizer adoption as subsidizing the cost of fertilizer by a, by 50%. Wow. So these small, what are often called nudges, behavioral yeah. nudges, can lead people to much more sort of optimal behavior. And pre-commitment like that has tended to work in a lot of cases. So people like having lock boxes to save money. They like forcing themselves into weight loss programs. They like, you know, this because they, they're aware that, um, that they may put things off too long. That's or, a great example you know. of, of um, the generalized uh, theory then, right? Or the framework. So you have the very specific experiment, but exactly. now you have a framework for human behavior that people like things like lockboxes, which you can then test, but you do have a general framework. So that's exactly. really, that's really, that's a We've great example. We've been applying example. that in Kenya, I'm starting a new experiment on maternal and child health and trying to help women figure out where to deliver their baby. So in an area like Nairobi, there are uh, hundreds and hundreds of places you could deliver your baby from the local laundromat to, you know, a beautiful private um, hospital and women and their spouses have a very difficult time choosing. There's not a lot of transparency about quality and cost. And so what often ends up happening is they don't decide or they wait till the last minute and they end up in the local public hospital, which has atrocious conditions and they get there too late. And so what we're experimenting with is a pre-commitment to deliver at a certain facility. I see. Um, 
uh, in order to, you know, sort of help the decision process, uh, and it's sort of an integrated part of a birth planning process. So just as you say, there are certain things that we've learned that are very generalizable. Defaults are another example. We know if we default you into a 401k plan, you are much more likely to save for retirement right. than if, if it's opt out than if it's opt in. So let, let me switch gears for a minute and, and uh, ask you about uh, how, how in this work do you get people outside the field um, to to get interested in it, to care about it, to support policies that would uh, address the needs of of the uh, the most vulnerable. Um, what it's probably a little bit outside your work as an economist, but do you see things that work in getting getting people to to really care about these issues and, and want to take some action? Yeah. So I think I think. You know, people respond to stories pretty well. And I think often, you know, we have now so many stories of um, things that were done wrong in terms of um, reaching people. So I think what resonates with a lot of people is that we have the technology to improve health and save lives. I mean, most of the things we need to save, um, you know, So three quarters of the deaths of children under five in the world are from infectious diseases, principally malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia. And we have most of the tools to fight those diseases. But, and, you know, science progresses tremendously rapidly on prevention and treatment and diagnosis. But what has been much slower is delivery. And how do we actually get these things to people, get them to use them, get them to use them appropriately? And my view is that, it's hard to do that from a top-down approach, that there's a, a method of kind of searching and experimenting to figure out what are the small changes we can make that make a huge difference in terms of reaching people and save us money, right? right? And um, we need to invest in that experimentation process because there's a, there's a huge value to learning, even when things fail, especially when things fail. Yeah. There's a huge value to learning. Um, and um, I think people can get excited about being part of that search and part of the measurement process. And especially if you, know, you really are committed to translating those results into into um, policies and programs, or even, you know, I try to get people who run NGOs to get excited about embedding this type of evaluation in their, in their programs. So, uh, as you know, this, the, the students signed up for this class are from all over the world, and they're from various age groups, and, uh, and many of them will, you know, listen to these conversations and do the reading and, and want to know how they can either be supportive of good work or connect to other people and in other sources of information to find out more about issues in global health and, and uh, policies around poverty. And just thought before we sign off, I'd ask if you have any suggestions for what, what, what students can do. I'll just put in a plug for the Poverty Action Lab. Um, Great we website. Are, <laughs> uh, yeah, and we're coming on to our um, recruitment season and um, also to Innovations for Poverty Action, which um, is a, um, a nonprofit organization that does a lot of implementation of these randomized control trials and uh, we do quite a bit of hiring of people at all levels to uh-huh. go to the field and to um, learn how to do this type of work um, both in a policy context and in a very uh, sort of ground level um, so that would be a sort of a place to look at policy briefs and some of the background on this and also potentially have an opportunity to do this type of um to do this type of work. There's also, for those of you who are sort of inclined toward engineering, there are a number of new um, initiatives. I think there's one at BU and MIT and Berkeley that sort of combine um, engineers with people from public health and development to try to think about what kind of products we need that really think about human behavior mm-hmm. and field conditions and um, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, of course, I encourage you to become an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jessica Cohn, thank you so much for the encouragement and for the conversation. It's uh, thank you. your work is so important to the field, and I think for those of us who are interested in how to deal with these massive challenges, you show us how to take them in in pieces so that we can know we're really making a positive difference. So, Great. thanks thank very, you much. very much.